Hey everybody, welcome to our new unit and uh, our last unit here. Um, so this talks about, um, it talks about models as well. So our, our last unit talks about the, the, the wave model of light and the particle model of light. And now we're talking about different models of the atom. And you did a little bit of this in grade 10, but obviously we're going to go into a little bit more detail. Um, so yeah, so that's our, uh, yeah, that's, this is our, our new lesson. And, and the first lesson that we're going to talk about is a, a cathode ray tube. So curriculum stuff that you need to know, um, describe matter as containing discrete positive and negative charges, explain how the discovery of cathode ray tubes contributed to the development of atomic models. Uh, explain J.J. Thompson's experiment. So you need to know J.J. Thompson because they mention him by name in the curriculum. Um, determine the mass of an electron or ion given appropriate empirical data and derive a formula for charge to mass ratio. So this is also something that we're going to talk about quite a bit and you need to know how to calculate. So our very first model of the atom, if you remember from grade 10, was brought to us by John Dalton. So John Dalton gave us our first model of the atom, and he said that um, atoms were impenetrable in divisible spheres, and he, we, we nicknamed it the billiard ball model, right? So, so everything is a billiard ball. And this model still works a lot of ways in chemistry. I got my experiment set up here. Um, but if we're talking about uh, chemistry and we're talking about if you've done some organic chemistry in chemistry 30, we talk about this for our model of the atom. And what we're using is we're using Dalton's model where we have carbons and hydrogens and we can model propane this way. And we use the billiard ball model, right? We don't care about electrons. We don't care about protons. We just say that these are the atoms and they arrange themselves in this way and that's all we really need, right? So some, some models work in some situations and some models work in other situations and that's what we're going to uh, explore in this, in this unit. Um, so J.J. Thompson, um, Dalton's model was accepted for almost 100 years, and the only reason you need to change a model is if you get experimental evidence that shows problems with this model. Um, so what J.J. Thompson was experimenting with was a, a Crookes tube or a cathode ray tube. It was the, uh, the hottest Christmas toy in the 1900s where every scientist was playing with it. Um, so what, what a what Crookes tube is, is it's an evacuated glass chamber uh, with a gas like neon, or in any gas, it can be mercury, it can be neon, it can be hydrogen, it could be anything like that. So it's just a glass tube with, uh, with gas inside. And that's what I have right here. So in this tube is, uh, so they vacuum out all the air and then they just fill it with a gas. And I, I'm not 100% sure what gas this one's filled in within because it's, it's green. Uh, so it's not neon, but I don't know what it is. Maybe it's mercury because it's old and we wouldn't have that anymore in the classroom. So what you need to do to a Crookes tube or a cathode ray tube is you need to hook it up uh, with to high voltage power supply and then you get a beam of light. So he changed the type of metal in the cathode, but the beam would always be the same. So it wasn't the same as like a photoelectric, exper uh, photoelectric effect experiment where electrons were leaving and the type of metal, the type of uh, uh, photoelectric surface mattered. It didn't, it didn't matter the type of metal. He always got the same result no matter what he worked with. So I'm going to show you this photoelectric effect experiment. So this uh, over here is just uh, a high voltage. It switches my power from AC to DC, and then it, it hooks it up to a higher voltage so we can get that beam of light to appear. So I'll shut off my lights and I'll turn it on. It's not great with the camera the way that I have it right now, but you can see this beam of light appears and I'll pick it up so you can see it oops, a little bit better like that. So we have this beam of light here. And the, the interesting thing about the beam of light is that if you take a magnet, so here I have a magnet, and you take a magnet and you put it by it, you'll see that that beam of light bends, which is weird. 
right? If you took your flashlight and you put a magnet by it, you wouldn't get that beam of light to bend. So the fact that a magnetic force or a magnetic field is making that beam of light bend means that it's not light. It, it looks like light, but it's not light. Okay, and that's uh, the significance of this experiment. So when the magnet was brought near this beam, it bent. Does light get bent by magnetic fields? No. Well, we've done a lot of studies on magnetic fields and um, what, what can be bent or move in a circle in a magnetic field? Well, a charged particle can, right? So a charged particle can be bent by a magnetic field. So, so maybe this beam of light wasn't actually light, it was a, a charged particle. So uh, this showed that this beam was not light, but it was a stream of charged particles. I'm recording a video, Mr. Pando. Oh, yeah. Get out of here. Wait, I wanted to be on the video. Go say hi to the camera. Here? Yeah, Mr. Pandos wanted to say hi. Yeah, hey everybody. Enjoy your physics 30? Physics 30, yeah. Physics 30, everybody. <laughs> so here we go. Did my face go on there? Yeah. <laughs> okay, the internet's back, I guess. Okay, thanks. You're thanks, back. Mr. Pandos. Oh, are you still recording? Yes. Oh. <laughs> okay. Uh, anyways. So Thomson's apparatus. Uh, so at this time, so we're sort of going back in time here because we know about the charge of the electron and Robert Millikan found us the charge of the electron, but we're, we're going back in time uh, before we actually knew this. So at this time, both the charge and the mass of this charged particle, I'm doing air quotes there, uh, was not known. Uh, so Thomson created an apparatus to study this mysterious charged particle, which consisted of three parts. It, it consisted of an acceleration chamber, a velocity selector region, and an ion selector region. So we're going to talk about the acceleration chamber first. And we've actually done this before. Uh, lots of the stuff we do in this unit is, is reviewed from the past units. So in this acceleration chamber, the charged particles were allowed to accelerate across charged plates to a certain speed. Uh, this could be adjusted by adjusting the voltage. So we've done this before. And uh, if we have a charged particle, so let's say we have a negatively charged particle here. Well, here it's got electrical potential energy. And then it zips across to the other side, and as it leaves the other side, it's got kinetic energy. So to solve this question, we just have to use physics principle number five uh, there, where our, our energy before is equal to our energy after. Right? So let's do a question like that. So an electron accelerated through a potential difference of five times 10 to the three volts. What is the maximum speed of the electrons? So um, over here, we have electrons, right? So they're going to accelerate over here. Like I said before, this has EPE and this has EK. So it's just a simple law of conservation of energy question, physics principle number five. And EPE is equal to EK. EPE you might not remember, but remember we break this down into VQ. And then EK we can break down into 1 half MV squared. So we want to find the speed, so we just move the 2 up top and the mass down below and square root it. And that's pretty much it. Okay, So we would go uh, 2 times our voltage, which they give us in the question, 5 times 10 to the 3 volts. Our charge is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs, and the mass of the electron is 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31 kilograms. Okay, and this is pretending that we actually know what all this stuff is, but J.J. Thompson didn't know, and we'll talk about how that affected his experiment. So we will go 2 times 5 times 10 to the 3 times 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19, and then we will divide by uh, 
times 10 to the negative 31. And remember, a good checker is that we, these are electrons, they can't go faster than the speed of light. So it's like, oh man, that's way faster than the speed of light. Oh, I forgot to square root it. And you should always get less than the speed of light. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Yes, as long as it's less than times 10 to the 8, we're good. So we get uh, 4.2 times 10 to the 7 meters per second. And that's how fast the electrons were going. Sorry, I'm just looking ahead. Okay. So that's the acceleration chamber. And then the velocity selector region. So during this section, the charged particles were allowed to pass through perpendicular magnetic and electric fields. So the charged particle experiences a downward deflection from the magnetic force and an upward deflection from the, um, from the electric field. Um, or magnetic field and electric field. So um, yeah, so this is the electron and it's traveling through this region. So we have, a, according to this picture, we have a north and a south magnet and this is kind of out of the page and this is sort of into the page. Um, so I'm gonna draw this onto my whiteboard because we know how to figure out the direction of the forces. Okay, so I'm gonna switch to my whiteboard. Um, so this is my electron, sort of to represent this in 2D. Um, the magnetic field on the picture was going into the page. Um, so we can represent that with x's. And what we need to revive here again is we need to revive those, those left-hand rules. So if you remember, your thumb is the direction of the charged particle in that magnetic field, and then your fingers are the direction of the magnetic field. And when I put my fingers going into the page, my thumb going this way, you can see that my hand is going to push it downwards. Okay, so my magnetic force gets pushed downwards. And then the second set, uh, and then at the same time, I'm gonna draw them as separate, but they happen at the same time. They're not separate sections, They're, they sort of overlap. We, in the picture, they, they show us a positive plate up here and a negative plate up here. Well, as that electron go through the electric field, well, it's going to be attracted to that positive plate. So we have an electric force that's upwards. So what Thompson would do is he could adjust the voltage in here, and you can adjust the voltage to change your magnetic field, uh, or the current, I guess, to, to adjust the magnetic field, and he could make this electron pass through undeflected. And if it passes through undeflected, we can use physics principle number zero, where we have no net force acting on the object. And when we use physics principle number zero, our force electric is equal to our force magnetic, right? The very first thing we did in physics 20. So by adjusting the electric and magnetic field strengths, he could make it so that uh, the charged particles pass through this region undeflected. And that's, that's usually what's gonna happen. So let's do a question that like this. So a fast, a fast moving stream of electrons enters a velocity selector region and they give us the electric field and they give us a magnetic field, and it passes through without deflection. Determine the speed of the electrons. So when it passes through undeflected, like I said before, we're using physics principle zero, and our, oops, our force electric is equal to our force magnetic. So to break these down, you'll have to remember that force electric is electric field times our charge, and our magnetic field is equal to QTP. And we have charges on either side on top, so they would cancel out. So we end up getting electric field is equal to velocity times our magnetic field. So our magnetic field goes down here, and then it's a really easy calculation. So it's 10 thousand newtons per coulomb as our electric field and our magnetic field is 15.5 millitesla so times 10 to the negative 3 teslas and if I plug that all in I get 10,000 divided by 15.5 times 10 to the negative 3 
and that's the speed of my electrons as they pass through that velocity selector region, 6.45 times 10 to the e, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5 meters per second. Okay, so two ways of finding speeds right there, and th this is all stuff that we've done before in this, in this course. Okay, and the last selector, the last region is the ion selector region. So a beam of charged particles is passed through a separate magnetic field. So this is a different magnetic field, which causes them to move in a circular path. So just to switch it up, I have uh, a positive charge, because it can be positive or negative traveling through here at any time. Um, so uh, they travel in, in that direction. So we can use our third left-hand rule to figure that out as well. So I'm just gonna draw it on my board here. And we can see why they go in that direction. Okay. So because it's a positive charge, remember that instead of using our left hand, we wanna use our right hand, okay? So my positive charge is moving this way and my magnetic field is coming out of the page. So what's gonna happen is initially there's going to be deflection this way. So it's going to experience a magnetic force and it's going to be moving in that direction, right? And now my thumb points in the direction it's moving and now the force is that way. So it causes it to move in a circle like that because that force is always towards the center of the circle. So that's what's happening in the ion selector region. So because no particles were known to be smaller than the atom, no masses and charges were known for these subatomic particles. So with Thomson's apparatus, he wasn't able to find the mass of the charge separately, but what he was able to find was a charge to mass ratio. So I can show you, uh, create a formula for finding the charge to mass ratio. So when we plug stuff in, we knew the charge and the mass, but he did not know the charge and the mass. So if we use the acceleration chamber, we can come up with a formula for the charge to mass ratio. So that was our EPE turning into EK. And this is VQ equaling one half mv squared. So creating these ratios isn't something that, a skill that we've done before, but it's really easy. What we want to end up with is we want to end up with a charge to mass ratio. So what I'm gonna take, do with this formula is I'm gonna move the mass down below because then I have charge to mass. So I move that mass down below and then the voltage here. Okay, so what that means is that our charge to mass ratio is equal to v squared and instead of saying one half, I'll just say two B. You can say one half on top, it doesn't make a difference like that. But this is a formula that we get to find the charge to mass ratio. And this charge to mass ratio is just, is just one number. You have to remember that. You have to think of the charge to mass ratio as just an individual number, even though it's two things. If you think of it as one number, it's, it's a lot easier. Okay. We can also use the velocity selector region to find a charge to mass ratio. So that was when our magnetic force is equal to our electric force. And our magnetic force is QVB. And our electric force is EQ. Right? If we want to find, uh, or sorry, hmm, never mind. We don't want to find a charge to mass ratio with this, but if I move my magnetic field down here, uh, what that allows us to do is that it allows us to plug a speed into here if we need to, right? Uh, so we can combine these together. I can show you them combined together. So our charge to mass ratio is equal to, so that 2V, that two times the voltage, stays on the bottom here. But instead of velocity, I'm going to put electric field over magnetic field there, right? And because our velocity is squared, these could be squared. So we created this whole big formula for our charge to mass ratio. So that's one way of finding our charge to mass ratio. And there is another way of finding our charge to mass ratio. So I'm going to erase this. Our other way of finding a charge to mass ratio is using physics principle number two. So in that 
uh, ion selector region. So this is the ion selector region. Uh, the magnetic field makes it move into a circle. Okay. And Fc is equal to mv squared over r, and this is equal to qvb. And one of our velocities cancels out. So again, we can get a charge to mass ratio by just moving the mass underneath here, and then the b under here. So what we end up getting is we end up v over br equals this charge to mass ratio. So we have two ways of calculating this charge to mass ratio. Okay. Um, so let's do an example. A stream of charged particles having an initial speed of 5.7 times 10 to the 6 meters per second enter a magnetic field of 0 0.264 teslas. As they enter the magnetic field, they deflect into a circular path with a radius of 7.5 centimeters. Determine the charge to mass ratio. Okay, so yeah, we're going to use that physics principle number two, and I'll just do it again, where Fc equals our force magnetic, mv squared over r equals qvb. One of our velocities cancels out, and we always want it to be charged to mass, so we put our mass underneath, and then our b underneath here, and we get v over br is equal to our charge to mass ratio, one number that we get. So we have the speed of the charged particles, 5.7 times 10 to the 6 meters per second. They give us a magnetic field is 0 0.264 teslas. And then our radius, they tell us is 7.5 centimeters and centa is times 10 to the negative 2. So 7.5 times 10 to the negative 2. So if we calculate all of this, we get... 7 times 10 to the 6 Oops, divided by 0 0.264 times 7.5 times 10 to the negative 2. Just double checking my numbers. And we get this. So this is our, our charge to mass ratio. So it's just a value. So we get our charge to mass ratio value, and we get one number, 2.8. Uh, we have two sig digs, so 2.9 times 10 to the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 8. And because it's charged to mass, we get coulombs per kilogram. So that's our charge to mass ratio. So we calculated the charge to mass ratio. Cool, we have this number. What the heck does it mean? Well, that's what J.J. Thompson had to figure out. So when J.J. Thompson found the charge to mass ratio for a cathode ray particle, it turned out to be 1.756 times 10 to the 11 coulombs per kilogram. Okay. So the charge to mass ratio for the smallest atom was a hydrogen ion. So if you take hydrogen, which was the smallest known atom, um, and you take off one of its electrons, so you give it a charge. They didn't know the electron existed, but you give it a charge, right? Uh, electrons have a very small mass, which we'll learn here. Uh, it's basically just a hydrogen atom, and this is the charge to mass ratio. So what he found was that the charge to mass ratio was different for this cathode ray particle compared to the hydrogen atom. So um, um, let me just switch to over here. So what does that mean? Well, if you think of a charge to mass ratio, giving this charge to mass ratio number. So in order to make this charge to mass ratio number bigger, and it was for this cathode ray particle, you either could up the charge because they have a direct relationship, or you could decrease the mass because they have an inverse relationship. And it was pretty easy to tell that this cathode ray particle had the same charge as a hydrogen ion. So this was out. So what this told him is that um, because the charge to mass ratio was so much bigger for the cathode ray particle, it meant that the mass was smaller, much, much, much smaller. 
So he was able to determine that uh, there was something smaller than the smallest atom. So this is the first subatomic particle, something smaller than the atom. So what Thomson discovered was a negatively charged particle emanating from the cathode was an electron. So he, he in sense, discovered the electron. So he had this charge to mass ratio. He knew this electron was this cathode ray particle. He knew it was smaller. Uh, and J.J. Thompson discovered that charge to mass ratio for the electron. And then we learned later, Robert Millikan did with his oil droplet experiment. Uh, he discovered the charge of the electron. And then once you have the charge to mass ratio and you have the charge, you could discover the mass of the electron. And in comparison to the mass of the electron, the mass of the smallest atom was 1.67 times 10 to the negative 27. The electron was almost 2,000 times smaller in mass than the smallest atom. And what we find is that because the mass of the electron is so small, we can neglect it, right? What this means is that if I have a hydrogen atom and I have a hydrogen ion, the only thing different about these is this has one less electron. This will have a mass of 1.67 times 10 to the negative 27, and this will also have 1.67 times 10 to the negative 27. If you take off an electron, it's like weighing yourself and then cutting your toenails and expecting a different weight. They're so small, it's not going to make a difference. Uh, so here's a little video on uh, the discovery of the cathode ray particle, the electron. So give it a watch and then... Our next great discovery is the story of Joseph Thompson and the electron. Here we are. So everything that we can see is made of chemicals. That's right. What's the future? And they're all bonded through electron interactions. Thank goodness. And the future. To find out about it, I paid a visit to Harvard University. Dudley Hirschbach is a professor here and winner of the 1986 Nobel Prize in Chemistry for his research into the dynamics of chemical elementary processes. So, uh, Thompson didn't discover the electron. Well, it's of course said that way, but he didn't discover in the sense that he said, Eureka, I've got this thing, here it is. He did an experiment that allowed him to measure the ratio of the charge, the electric charge, to the mass. And then later he was able to get a rough measurement of the charge and therefore show that the mass was very, very small. It was about one two thousandth of the mass of the lightest known atom, hydrogen atom. So it showed that he could extract in the experiment a very small piece of an atom. Well, that was a tremendous shock. People didn't Pun imagine. Intended. Yes, yes. <laughs> Electrical piece of an atom. It was a very small and, and, part of the atom. And, and, and so At the time of his discovery, Thompson was a professor at England's University of Cambridge. He was using a device called a Crookes tube in his experiments. I happen to have here a little apparatus that's uh, akin to the one that J.J. Thompson used in 1897. It's called a cathode ray tube, just an evacuated little glass cylinder with some electrodes. And we can hook this up and uh, show the key points of his experiment. A replica of the first CRT. Yeah, it's the first cathode ray tube. It's ancestor of the television tube, as a matter of fact. You do the last one, and we should get a stream of cathode rays or electrons going there, and it'll show up, a few of them bang into this phosphor-coated piece of cardboard there. Here, I'll give you a magnetic field you can use to deflect the electrons. When Thompson exposed the stream of cathode rays to a magnet, the stream would bend. Since magnets can only affect matter, this meant the stream of rays was composed of some kind of electrically charged substance called radiant matter. After many hours of observing and measuring, Thompson realized he'd found the first subatomic particles. The ray was a stream of electrons. It was a revolutionary discovery. Some years later, a student of Thompson, Ernest Rutherford, was able to show 
that the positive charge in atoms, which was, of course had to be there to balance the negative charges of these little electrons that were scooting around, was localized in a tiny, tiny nucleus, uh, 100,000 times smaller than the size of the atom. And so almost all the mass was, of course, in that nucleus as well, because electrons are so light. And that's still the model we have today, right? That's the basic model for atoms, and of course the key to understanding everything involving atoms. Like chemistry. Like chemistry in particular. This is your homework. So there's some mass spectrometers, and this is just Thomson's apparatus, is later called a mass spectrometer, and this is just some stuff on charge to mass ratio. So give this a go, and let me know how it goes, and if you need help, I will help you.